Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Cyber October event. Um, we started this uh, uh, from in the uh, Department of ITDS um, last year, uh, and it was a success. It was success because we had a lot of support from, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, uh, noted cybersecurity experts like um, Dr. Stahl, Dr. Kranz, um, Michael Brissenden, I'm sorry if I did not say it right. And, you know, so we are, uh, um, we have a great lineup for uh, future meetings as well. Before we get started, I'm going to play a quick message from uh, Professor Keppelman. And this was message was recorded actually last year. Last year. But as we will listen to the record, um, uh, we, will, uh, we will hear that what he said a year ago is absolutely true even today. And I would not be surprised if this will remain true for the next 20 years or so. But anyway, let's get started with that. And I'm going to uh, share that in a second. And we also have, um, uh, you know, um, Professor Dillon from uh, <clears throat> ITDS department attending. Uh, thank you, Professor Dillon. And we may have others also joining from the faculty. Um, without further, I hope uh, you can see my screen. If somebody can give me a thumbs up, oh, that would be good. All right, thanks. I'm going to start playing and if there's an issue with sound, Hi, please let me. Hi, I'm Leon Kappelman. I'm a professor of information systems and I'm the chair of the Information Technology and Decision Sciences Department. And I would like to welcome you on behalf of the department to this Cyber October. You're the smart ones, the ones who have decided that this is worth investing some of your time to participate and learn from this great lineup that our faculty has put together for you over the next four weeks, the next four Fridays. People, maybe you've gotten a little bit too complacent about the threats of cybersecurity, but these are very real and they affect not only us as individuals, but our organizations, our families, our finances, and yes, even national security in our country. Not only that, there's great job opportunities in cybersecurity at all levels of the economy, from small businesses to, to giant government organizations, the military, and all kinds of devices too. Because as we connect more and more devices to the internet, those devices become vulnerable entry points as well. So I welcome you to Cyber October on behalf of the ITDS department, and I hope you really learned something. Thank you for your time. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, and that was thanks to Professor Kappelman. And I'm going to show uh, for a second uh, our lineup for the rest of the program, and then we'll get started with Dr. Stahl, who is going to talk first about the principles of uh, cybersecurity. But let me quickly uh, share this information. All right, here. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm sharing here is uh, our lineup for the Cybersecurity Awareness Month program. Oh, are you able to see my screen? Mm -hmm. um, so today uh, we are having um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Stahl, Dr. Kranz, uh, uh, Mr. Michael uh, Brzezendine, uh, and I'll be uh, saying a couple words later on. And on October 15th, uh, we have uh, Department of Homeland Security here. We have folks from PepsiCo, uh, Dr. Uh, Obi from our department. On October 22nd, uh, we have Dr. Jose Lineros from accounting department with uh, another person from the industry, uh, Mr. Jay Demler. Then we have Professor Kim also talking on October 22nd and we conclude with uh, a great- Deepak, uh, you have a wrong screen shared, I think. Um, I'm just seeing the Zoom page. 
Oh, thank you so much. Is this the right one? Right. Okay. All right. So I won't repeat what I said, but uh, uh, this information is going out to everybody in UNT and others outside. But today's lineup, uh, we will get started with it. And then we have events on October 15th, the same time, 12 p.m. to 1.30. And um, as you can see, uh, we have also uh, ITDS uh, faculty members uh, talking, uh, Dr. Obi, uh, Dr. Dan Kim, uh, Professor Dillon, who is here right now with us. So we have a great lineup, a lot of uh, different aspects of cybersecurity that we'll discussing. And now I'm going to stop talking and I will introduce uh, Dr. Stan Stell. Uh, Dr. Stell has been in cybersecurity world for a long time and he has started a um, group called uh, Secure the Village. So if you, uh, you, you should look up securethevillage.org uh, and you will hear a lot about uh, how to, what are the principles? What, what are the big things that we should know about cybersecurity? Uh, so I think with that, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Stahl. Great, super. Thanks, Deepak. Uh, grateful to be here. Thanks everybody for taking some of your time uh, to be here with us. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, let's go. So uh, everybody sees this cyber crisis. Yes. How I like to position this. That, what we're really talking about here is securing the economy, protecting our identities. And beyond that, ultimately, we're talking about preserving our freedoms. And you'll see some of that as, as, as we go on through the, the, the morning and then throughout the month with the other events that uh, Deepak that, that you've got scheduled is really, it's great what you're doing. Kudos to you for spreading the word, spreading the gospel, so to, so to speak. Uh, Steve and I'll be talking, I, I can take a very strategic view. Uh, I, I'm not sure that 30,000 feet isn't uh, too low already. I'm more like 80,000 or 100,000 or some people just tell me I'm way out in space. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. And then Steve is down ground level uh, and, and he'll, he'll provide a, a checklist for you uh, for, for that. In, in, in terms of, of context, I want to share two things. One's a, a, a short video of uh, who Secure the Village is, what we're about, and, and why, why Secure the Village. So there's a little video that uh, we had put together uh, not too long ago. This is, you know, it's, it's only a, perhaps a couple of months old. So please enjoy the, the next 90 seconds. It kind of, as I say, puts context on, on what we're talking about. Cybersecurity isn't simple, so if you think you're about to watch a cute video with bouncy music that tells you how what you thought was hard is actually easy, and what you thought was complicated is actually just like one, two, three, rest assured, this isn't it. Because cybersecurity isn't simple, and what we do weaves together law, technology, risk management, governance, public policy, education, political philosophy, psychology, and even questions of freedom. And of war and peace. Cybersecurity isn't simple, but the values that motivate us are the value that says we should treat others' information as we would like our information to be treated, that cybersecurity is an urgent civic duty for the 21st century citizen, and the value that says none of us is as smart as all of us. And that's why we're getting everyone involved, building bridges between those who dedicate their lives to cybersecurity and helping everyday citizens complete that last mile, transforming our neighbors into powerful cyber guardians. Cybersecurity isn't simple, but the values that motivate us are. And our values say that there's a seat at the table for anyone with something to contribute to the global exchange of knowledge we're building at Secure the Village. Because from the boardroom to the living room, it takes a village to secure the village. So that's kind of who we are and what we're about, why we're about what we're doing bringing the community together like today's event so that all of us uh, know what our role is and has a commitment to doing what we can do 
uh, to, to keep ourselves, to keep our families, to keep our communities uh, uh, appropriately secure. So with that, let me go back to the PowerPoint um, and just call out that this is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. October has been Cybersecurity Awareness Month for several years now. And the idea is do your part, be cyber smart. That, that's the, the essence of this. Uh, if you've got questions or anything, put them in the chat. Steve and I'll try to get to them at, at appropriate places. Uh, today, I'm putting in the chat box my own contact information. Please feel free to, to reach out to me. Uh, and, and let me get started uh, by, here's a, you can read about my background and all and, and all, but I want to tell a story about my background that illustrates the difference between where we were when I got into this field nearly well, what is now not nearly 40 years ago, but more than 40 years ago, and, and, and where we are today. Back in the late 1980s, I had the opportunity, I was working for one of the aerospace companies, a uh, major player in, in cyber in security then, and I had a meeting at Kelly Air Force Base with the general there who runs encryption and all of that for the Air Force. He was in charge. He was the, the main guy in the Air Force around all their encryption. He was the interface to NSA for the Air Force. And when I walked into his office, and this was the 80s now, before the internet, he was sitting at a desk. Behind him on his desk were like seven separate computers. One of those computers was a direct connection to the White House. Another of those computers was a direct connection to office in the Pentagon, specific office. Another of those was a direct connection to NSA headquarters, another a direct connection to the Strategic Air Command, and so on. If you In those days, if you wanted to talk securely to somebody, you needed a direct line, a physical line from your computer to their computer with nothing in between it. There was no, if and the only sharing that was done was sharing where everybody was cleared to have access to all the information that might be discussed. Back in those days, cybersecurity was rather simple. You need to secure something. If Steve and I need to talk securely, we get at least phone line between us, put our computers on those. Those computers are on nothing else. We got it made. Nobody, well, provided we're doing it appropriately, nobody can get in and talk. That's not the way the world is anymore. We're on the internet. Right now, we're all talking in a Zoom context, but at the same time, my computer is connected to Amazon, it's connected to Google, it's connected to Microsoft Teams, it's connected to, Am I mean, all of these different places, which means that all of those places become vectors for an attack. And that gets us to the situation we're in now. Three things to remember. First, cybercrime's exploding, and so are the laws that uh, relate to it, it's growing, it's costly, it can be fatal, okay? Information security is a management discipline. At the corporate level, it's management leadership at the top, at the individual level, and Steve will talk about this, it's that individual, it's that discipline that says you do the things you need to do just like you do other things we need to do in our lives, take our vitamins, exercise, you know, brush our teeth, lock our doors, and tone is set at the top. And meeting this crisis requires all hands on deck, all of us, every one of us, business leaders, residents, citizens, certainly educators, you're in that group, uh, students and faculty, you're citizens in this case, you're residents in this case. And you've got your own security of University of North Texas to manage as well, organizationally. So I'm gonna take you through a quick walk through the wild side, if you will how bad all this stuff right is. Just recently, you know, 53 million people got breached, uh, had their information stolen through a breach of, of, of T-Mobile. Uh, that was last month, uh, well, what is now uh, six weeks ago. Uh, earlier in the summer in May, we had the cyber attack on uh, the, the pipeline uh, and it, it had to shut down and we had gas lines. Uh, up the East Coast, like I haven't seen since the 1970s. Uh, some of you on this call probably weren't even alive then, but we had gas lines back then. We're, we had them today again, well, today in, 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 in May, uh, as a result of a cyber hack. Um, our meat structure all over the world, uh, JBS, the world's largest meat 
hacking company, paid $11 million in ransomware. Microsoft was hit. 18,000 of their customers got infected. Think about that. 18,000 hit simultaneously through an attack uh, on, on solar winds and, and through uh, Microsoft as well. Who's doing it? We suspect Russia. We suspect China. These are nation states coming at us. Um, now, I, I just mentioned the Microsoft Exchange hack. That was 30,000 companies that were infected in, in that case. And that looked to be a Chinese espionage group. That's all just the last couple of months, last few months, if you will. Go back a couple of years. This is a less commonly known story. You're looking at China's J-20 stealth fighter. It's really an advanced fighting aircraft. Absolutely. And it should be because it was built, stolen on our F-35 technology. Chinese hacked our aerospace companies, stole our designs, built their plane based on our designs and making it worse, having our designs, they can search for vulnerabilities in our designs. And so actually their stealth fighter is more secure than our stealth fighter because the enemy's got all the information about our stealth fighter. Estimates from a 2019 CNBC survey of CFOs, one in five corporations, one, 20%, say China's stolen their intellectual property within the last year. Think about that. One in five of our organizations, okay? That's like death by a thousand cuts. That's how the enemy is beating us. Um, story from the New Yorker recently, the incredible rise of North Korea's hacking army. North Korea is really isolated from the rest of the world, uh, ex except for China. They don't have resources. Uh, they can't have access to the international banking system. How they get money, they hack. Uh, ransomware and a lot of those things, cybercrime come to us, but they're also hacking into the uh, international banking system. They tried to steal, uh, steal a billion dollars from the SWIFT banking system, uh, Bangladesh, and managed to get away with, with uh, several million dollars. Uh, luckily, we caught the whole story. Uh, you know, we, we caught the attack and were able to keep them from the, the billion dollars that they tried to get. And they still got close to $100 million. Think about what that does to their balance of trade, their ability to feed their people and build their missiles. With our money, they're doing that. So let me take you through the story in three slides, three cartoons, kind of lay out where we're at. First is organized crime. For health and safety reasons, we'll be transitioning to cybercrime, and they have. Cybercrime is not an individual sitting in their basement trying to hack in. Cybercrime is an organized ecosystem of companies that some companies find zero day exploits, find zero, find vulnerabilities in software. That's their role in the ecosystem. And they sell those, uh, those vulnerabilities, knowledge of those vulnerabilities and the, uh, the ways to, to break them, the exploits. Others look to build email databases and they lease those out. Others create ransomware attacks and they lease that. If I wanna do a ransomware attack, if I wanna to go to the dark side, I don't have to do anything more than go on the dark web and license ransomware as a service, get an email, like, you know, lease an email database, and basically I'm in business. And encouraging this to go along is Vladimir Putin and his friends in Russia. He's like the Tony Soprano, the Michael Corleone of cybercrime. Certainly he, he runs the biggest cybercrime family. You're free in Russia to do whatever you want on the attack side, steal money from the West, the one thing you can't do is steal from Russia, but he's happy if you steal from, from us. And then the next cartoon is, this is our defense. In this corner, we got firewalls, encryption, antivirus software, etc. And in this corner, we have Dave, human error. And it's not just human error at the end user place. It's human error up and down the chain. It's, it's human error in IT. It's human error in operations, it's human error in the companies that are developing software uh, that's defensively oriented, but still we're making mistakes and those mistakes are coming back to bite us. How bad is it? 
Uh, this is a ransomware note. Your, your computers have been infected. Pay us 0.47 Bitcoins, about 2,500 US dollars. Do it in the next two days. After that, the price doubles. Um, and you got to pay. I mean, the cost of ransomware, we'll see some st statistics in a few moments, just what the cost of ransomware has become over the years. Uh, business email compromise is another major vector of cybercrime. You get an email, you're, you're working in a company, you're, let's say, the chief financial officer, you get an email that looks like it comes from the owner of the company or the chief executive officer that says, hey, Bob, I need you to transfer $100,000 into this bank account, right? And I need you to do it today because we got a payment we got to do. It's fraudulent. You end up giving away that, that money. Uh, and it's not just in the business context. We've seen it in the email compromise. This kind of activity um, in when you're buying a house uh, is rampant. People are making their down payments and their final payments to, a to buy a house, and they're doing it to fraudulent accounts. So they still owe that money. They borrowed it from their bank, but it never gets to the seller of the house. That's the kind of stuff that's, that's going on here. Uh, COVID has just amped this up so much. Uh, email scams in just during lockdown surged 667% in March of 2020. Uh, based on studies, because we're all working at home and we're all doing 17 things at once, and we got the dogs coming in and the children coming in and all of that to deal with, uh, we're three times more likely to kick, to, to, to get, uh, you know, click on, on a phishing scam than we were before. Brute force attacks where the bad guys just, they just try to log in with uh, every known password, every word in the English language, every word in every other language. They got databases of all of these things. And then every one letter combination, two letter combination, three letter combination, four letter combination, they've built databases of all the possible easy passwords and they just try brute force. Let's try this, let's try this. And it's not that they're sitting there typing it in, they have a little program that does these things. So that's that's part of what, what they're doing. Uh, and we've seen a big spike in ransomware variants about that. And this, this has been going on for years, but it's picked up a lot lately. Why should I hack a company when I can hack an IT vendor company and now get access to all of the vendors, all of that MSPs, customers, all in one fell swoop? And we're, the Secret Service has announced a major rise in uh, attacks on MSPs, on IT vendors. Here's the year-over-year -year ransomware growth. And you can see from June 20, June 20, June of 2020 to June of 2021, attacks are up uh, 450%, four and a half times for that. Average payouts are running somewhere about 136,000. Medium payment is about 47,000. So the dollar value of this stuff is like enormous. And it's resulted in, since a lot of this deals with uh, stealing information about residents, about citizens, there's been a lot of laws like our own here in America, HIPAA as, as one example, healthcare. There are laws on protecting information uh, in, health, in, in the financial services area. Uh, states here in America have laws, breach disclosure. Uh, California just recently passed the California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, on the flip side, Ohio, Connecticut, and Utah have laws now that if you've got certain cybersecurity defenses, they're like get out of jail free cards. You can't be sued uh, for, uh, for a breach. And we've got laws on, as you can see on this chart, for many of the nations around, around the world. Um, so that's, that's part of what's happening as well. And ultimately, we're in a time of crisis. Businesses suffer from losses. In some cases, if you want to play, you got to have security. Uh, the Defense Department, if you're a sub defense contractor, you must meet uh, certain requirements in the what's called the CMMC, uh, Capability Maturity Model Certification all the laws and regulations. And we're even seeing the corporate shield being broken down. Boards are being sued and board members are at risk of becoming personally liable for losses that occurred on their watch. 
uh, kind of a disincentive to be a board member in today's world. Residents were looking at identity theft, credit card fraud, loss of privacy, the whole surveillance economy, both from government um, and, and, and from all the, you know, Facebook and Google and all the other companies that are collecting our information. Bullying going on on the internet and cybercrime extortion and sextortion, things like that. And just as citizens, you know, the, the, cybercrime is a threat to national to our national infrastructures. I mean, look at the F-35 example. Uh, our whole economic base is being weakened. I mean, you, you look at, okay, so take a, you know, $5 million a month of cybercrime business email compromise just in LA that we know about. Well, translate that into actual employees and we're losing jobs because we're bleeding money out to these cyber criminals. Um, our intellectual property is being stolen. Our national security is weakened. All of the disinformation, misinformation that goes on as part of all of this, that just exacerbates the divisions that are already in America and undermines our election integrity at the same time. And ultimately, and why the word crisis is absolutely correct, our freedoms are at jeopardy because of this. So all of that's context for where we're headed. And real quickly, before I go over to Steve, let me start just with some good news. We can manage this. There's this great quote of, uh, and I, I forget off the top of my head who said it, but the world's, the future is already here. It's not just equally distributed. Part of the future is, you know, what's in the data breach investigation report that is maybe as 80% of successful attacks can be prevented. What's not well distributed is this knowledge and what are the things you have to do. So let's see how we manage it. First of all, we got to understand security is everyone's job. It's as I said, all hands on deck side. Then we got to protect our organizations. We got to be aware and engage citizens, and we got to protect our homes and families. And that's what Steve's going to talk about in a moment or two. Here's a chart from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. There's about 1.2 million of us who are like me. We make a living in cybersecurity. Uh, there's another 71 million of you, and that's everybody. Many of you talk uh, that's on this call uh, who are in information sensitive occupations. So you've got to protect your information and the information of your employers. And in your case, the information of University of North Texas. And then there's the vast majority of us, residents, families that have to need a level of security knowledge. Um, and, and, and that's what that's what we're working. And again, there's lots of organizations out there helping to do this. It's just the future is not equally distributed. So what do we do? I want to, at the organizational level, two things real quickly. Our company uh, has, over the years, we've been around cybersecurity. I've been 40 plus years, Citadel, my former company, and now Miller Kaplan, we're 20 years into this, seven strategies. There's gotta be leadership. Somebody's gotta be in charge of this stuff. You gotta have policies and standards that are related to national standards. Those standards exist. You gotta document and control your sensitive information. If you don't know what you have, then how can you protect it? You got to train and educate your people. They, as the cartoon showed, our people are our weakest link. Uh, the the uh, uh, vendor story, you know, we got to manage vendor solar winds uh, and, and third party security. We got to make sure that the people we're letting into our systems, including the IT vendors, are doing their job. And we got to manage the network from an IT security point of view. And ultimately, we've also got to be prepared. It's not a matter of if, it's when. You've heard that, I'm sure, before, but that's true. What's not on this chart is cyber insurance. It's necessary, but it's not at all sufficient. Having life insurance doesn't mean I can smoke three packs a day. You know, I still can't smoke three packs a day, right? Still not good for me. It doesn't matter if I got life insurance. And the other piece about insurance is becoming harder and harder to get and is becoming more expensive because the cyber insurance broker coverage is, I mean, they're losing their shirts right now because of the rise in cybercrime that they weren't prepared for. And on this side, I wanna leave one quote of Peter Drucker's. He's a uh, management guru. Only three things happen naturally in organizations, friction, confusion, and underperformance. Everything else requires leadership. If you wanna manage your security, you gotta be, have that leadership, okay? Uh, on the, in where and engage citizens, um, 
you got to that that piece of it. You got to stay informed about all of this stuff. You got to protect your families. And Steve will get into what that looks like. Support cybersecurity at work and at the university. You know, uh, don't don't be one of those people that says, "Oh, I don't need to do that." Yes, you do need to do that. We're all in it together, and and we need you to do your part. All of you, uh, share your knowledge and expertise. You're going to walk away with from this with I hope a little more knowledge than you had when you walked in. Share that with people when you're at the uh, virtual water cooler, when you're talking to friends, help them understand what this is all about. And right now we're in a situation where President Biden has implemented several executive orders towards cybersecurity. Federal government with all of its dysfunction is really doing an excellent job, what they can do to support cyber resiliency, but it needs all of us to support that as well. So, so do that. Um, protect our homes and our families. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Let Steve pick up on that. And then I'll come back and Steve and I'll both be on together talking about uh, what else, you know, what, what else, some of the, the rest of this context, if you will. So uh, Dr. Krantz, please take it away. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dr. Stahl. That was amazing. Okay. Dr. Krantz. And, and uh, thank you, Professor Previn, for this opportunity. Thanks to the University of North Texas and, and to my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Stan Stahl. I learn something every time I listen to you and it's a privilege. So uh, uh, at, at, at you, you certainly got my, my hearty uh, thanks and applause for the wonderful presentation. So let me, let me get started and uh, talk about what I call Cyber Guardian, a Secure the Village talk for residents. All of us on this call are residents, we live somewhere. So uh, to me, when you're talking about a village, you wanna talk about residents, so I've generalized that. Um, and uh, let's get right into it. So there we go. I, I have picked up from Stan's uh, lead of using cartoons to make a point. Uh, this is one of my favorites uh, that I use in my talks. Um, and the wolf is saying, hi, I'm one of your Facebook friends. And, and just to share, a, this happened to my son. Uh, of course, he, he being a computer professional, he, he ferreted out the, the, real, the, the reality that someone was masquerading as a Facebook friend and he didn't fall for it, but this is, this is reality. So let's look at the definition. What is personal cybersecurity? It's maintaining control of personal information while using your devices, computers, smartphones, and others. You don't want unintended exposure of personal information and you wanna operate securely everywhere. This is, these are our goals. We're, we're all in that boat together today um, and uh, I grew up in an era, as uh, Stan talked about, those isolated uh, uh, computers, telephone lines years ago. Uh, I remember that as a, uh, through most of my life, and now we're in a connected world. So let me walk you through steps one through five of the, what I call the story of a cybercrime. Step one on the left, uh, the gentleman in the brown suit is the... Uh, uh, is the victim of this cyber crime. He opens an email, clicks on a link, opens an attachment, and, and that installs malware on the computer. The malware is that little green guy there. Step two, the malware now resident on his uh, computer uh, has a, is, a, in this case, a key logger and tracking the entries that, uh, that the gentleman is typing in acquires an ID and a password. And in this case, uh, it's to uh, uh, the, my bank. And, in the, and the ID is Steve the sucker. The password is I'm a moron. Step three, the, the malware sends that information, those two pieces of information to the bad guy. Step four, who logs in as me, gets the money and I've, I've, uh, I've lost. That's a story of a cyber crime, a typical outline of what's, of what's occurring and why we all need to be careful. Let's talk about networks overall. And, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna talk about our home environment and then talk about uh, 
the outside world environment. So starting, oops, starting from home, uh, when you set up your home Wi-Fi network, you want to make sure that the name is not personally related. The SSID, which is your Wi-Fi, is the acronym for your Wi-Fi network name, should not be personally associated because it beca it's public in the local area. You want a strong password. And when you're setting up your router, that little black box with the rabbit ears and routers look different, that's a little, uh, a little graphic of my personal router. You want to set up a firewall. You want to make sure that data transfer is encrypted. And that's your best bet to protect at least at, at its basic level, your Wi-Fi network. On the lower left, when you're, if you're at work, when you're doing work from home, you want to use a virtual private network. You want to shield your transmissions from your internet service provider and make it much more difficult for any bad guy to track what you're doing. You want to be careful with your passwords. You want to use strong passwords. And even more important than that, and I'm going to talk more in depth about 2FA, which is an acronym that's very hot today, stands for two-factor authentication, sometimes called MFA or multi-factor authentication. Uh, that is, a, and I'm going to I'm going to show a graphic of of, a, of how that works. But that may be more important than your passwords. If you if for important accounts, if you set up two-factor authentication, you are re greatly reducing the risk. You want to set up lock screens on your devices so that if you're if the device is idle. It automatically locks. And I'm going to show an example of mine from my smartphone a little bit later. And you also want to prepare for loss recovery. And there are some apps that you can, can set up in advance to protect against that. Some other things you can do you want on your devices, you want to make sure that any virus is installed and running. Most devices will come that way. They, they will, by default, have that in operation. You want to make sure that that occurs. When you're prompted by the manufacturer, update your software, update your operating system, update your apps. Uh, you want to do tune-ups if they're recommended. You want to back up your critical data. Certainly those of you who are at the university, if you're working on a paper, you're doing research, you want to back that stuff up and you want to back it up over the internet remotely. You don't want to keep, because disasters occur. Uh, when, when I give this talk in, in my uh, home state of California, I say, are there earthquakes? And people nod and they realize, yes, we better back this up remotely in case we have an earthquake and we lose our device. We lose anything that we might have locally, sadly. And we want to encrypt the contents as well so that if, uh, if we do fall victim to a cyber crime, it's much harder for the, uh, for the thief to un to, to uh, understand to learn information from our data. So now moving up to the top, the outside world where the internet lives, going from the right, cellular data. If I have my smartphone or my iPad, my tablet, that and I'm transmit and I'm communicating, it will typically use cellular data, and that is encrypted. So that's relatively protected. But what if I take them in a, to a Starbucks or an airport uh, or a public place where I'm tempted to use public Wi-Fi? The short answer is don't. It's risky. Even if there's a password, it's risky. What should you do? Pop up on the left, use the virtual private network. It's relatively inexpensive. Sometimes it will come with your uh, security suite of software. I, well, I'm, I'm not a representative, I, have, I use Norton, their security suite, and it includes a virtual private network option. Uh, and that will then protect you when you're using a, a public Wi-Fi. So that's a, that's a broad brush picture of the network environment. As I promised, I wanted to talk about two-factor authentication. Step one, I log in. In this case, I'm going. I'm logging into my bank account. I want it to be secure. I've set up two-factor authentication. So step two on the upper right, a code is sent to me. 
It goes to my the second device. Then I take that code, which I see on my smartphone, enter into my laptop to complete a secure login interchange. Just some more details about that. You can read that. I'm uh, in the interest of time. I'm going to go quickly, but there are apps that you can download, such as Authy or Duo Mobile or Google Authenticator, that makes it even more secure. So it makes two-factor authentication, uh, in, in particular, more secure. And if you're really security concerned, if you believe you're a high-risk person, consider buying a device like a YubiKey, and there's a little picture there. That is a time-based, one-time password, hardware-originated, that will probably give you the strongest form of two-factor authentication. So security is a relative term, and I wanted to talk about that in that context and, and explain that there is no completely secure. So if we look at three areas. I just uh, uh, picked three areas, web, uh, website or app login, that area, that, that activity that we do, networks again, and passwords. What's the most secure in the case of a website or a, an app login? As I just explained with two-factor authentication, uh, uh, if I invest in a YubiKey, relatively cheap, less than $100, one-time expense that you plug into your device, it gives you the most secure interchange for login. Halfway in the middle, just ordinary two-factor authentication, which will use SMS, a, 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 an unencrypted protocol for texting that second factor. The least secure is just the ID and the password. And certainly passwords should, at a minimum, you should try to make them unique to the particular service you're using and complex. The, the network, most secure is to, to spend the extra money on a virtual private network, shielding not only the outside world, but also your internet service provider. In the middle, your home Wi-Fi or cellular data tends, if you've set, it, set them up correctly, or uh, in case of cellular data, they'll both, it'll be encrypted and relatively secure. The least secure, again, is public Wi-Fi. And at the bottom, here are some examples of passwords. The most secure is recommended by NIST, the, na the uh, uh, national uh, agency. They recommend a phrase like spot likes belly rubs on his tummy. If, if your dog is, has a different name, it should, you don't have to make it Spot. You can make it Fido or Freddy, whatever you want. Uh, the mo um, in the middle, it's one of these uh, un unmemorable concoctions of characters. And the last but not least, and it's shocking to note that there are many, many audits that have done that have found that in exposed data of millions of people, the, the, one of the most popular passwords is password, shameful. Don't do that. Okay, so let me now walk through what I consider, and actually this has been vetted. Stan and I have iterated on this, and uh, we've worked out a compromise uh, of the top 10, the things that you all of you should be doing. Number one, freeze your credit. At the four, count them, four major credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, and Innovus. Easy to do five minutes each uh, and to, to, to complete that. You want to check your credit rating. That will prevent the worst kind of identity theft uh, and someone taking out a big loan in your name, getting the cash, and then bye, you're stuck with the debt. Number two, talked about this a couple of times. This is the third time. Two-factor authentication. Make sure at your government accounts, your bank accounts, your investment accounts, your credit card accounts, two-factor authentication. Number three, as I said before, keep your software up to date when the manufacturer has an update. Don't procrastinate. Do it that day or that moment. Install antivirus. Most devices will come with that natively. Number five, talked about passwords. Long, memorable, unique. Now we're moving on the second set. Number six, in email, don't click on attachments or links unless sure of source. And I know Stan and I, we talked about, we talked about this, uh, we talked about this yesterday, but 
be very, very careful. And, and does it make sense? Does this, was this expected or unexpected? That's important to, to understand when you're receiving an email. If you're not sure, call the person. I've done that. Number seven, setting up your home router, as I talked about earlier, with a non-personal SSID or Wi-Fi network name. Memorable strong password encryption. WPA2 is the common standard today. Number eight, a remote backup of your files. And the word multi-version, I need to add that in. Multi-version means you're, you're, you have better security against a ransomware attack. Number nine, smartphone lock screen with an alternate phone number and an email address. Think about it. You leave your smartphone at a restaurant. You go home. Oh, God, where's my smartphone? If you have a smart smartphone lock screen with an alternate phone number, so a good Samaritan or the restaurant or the, the, the venue where you are, if, the, if, if they're good people, they'll call that phone number or they'll send you an email. So here's an example of mine. That is my beautiful wife. I show her off every time I make this presentation. Uh, that's her phone number. Not, but it, for the purposes of this example, it's our phone number and my email. Number 10. Now, this particular number 10, I started out making these presentations to audiences of seniors, of which I am a longtime member. You can tell by the, by the hair color. Uh, create a <laughs> kick the bucket letter for your ears. Now, what is a kick the bucket letter? Well, most of us, or some of us, and, and I know I'm talking to a young crowd out there, maybe you don't have a will, maybe you don't have a trust, maybe you don't have an advanced health care directive, might want to consider it. This is a letter of your computer technology details, you, the, the websites, the IDs, the passwords, that in the event of, of, of your incapacitation or your uh, death, your heirs, your significant others can, can take hold of that online life. In some cases, remove you. In some cases, close accounts. It's an important thing to spend some time creating. That's my top 10. This is my favorite slide. It's called the six pins. Number one, Experian, Experian free spin. Experian, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the um, uh, one of the uh, uh, credit bureaus that you want to do, create a freeze. TransUnion is number two. Equifax, up until very recently, those Equifax guys, they changed the name. They went from a freeze pin to a, uh, a, a two-factor authentication account setup. But you, I still have a freeze pin with them. Number four, uh, Inova's freeze pin. Number five, let me talk a little bit about this. You want to make sure with your cell phone provider that you have a PIN, a, a, a memorable, unique sequence of numbers that they will challenge anyone who calls them to identify you. And in, in, in sadly, a lot of our personal information is available on the internet for sale or cheap. So someone can call your, can, who wants to take over one of your accounts and defeat two-factor authentication. Here's what they'll do. They'll, they'll call your cell phone provider, give them your personal information, and if that you don't have a, a, a secret PIN, the cell phone company will just send, that, send a new SIM card to them. What happens to you? Your cell phone's now dead. Their cell phone's now your cell phone. Uh, 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 your cell phone's now their cell phone, I have to say. And they can now log in to your investment accounts because, and if two-factor authentication set up, they are able to receive that on their phone. Get a cell phone provider pin. I, whenever I talk about this, I have visions of everyone in the audience <laughs> calling their cell phone provider to get a pin if they don't have it. Finally, an IRS identity protection pin. That protects your ta income tax submission. 
in their many cases of crooks with your personal information, submitting a tax form for you early and they get a refund. And when you try to submit your taxes, the IRS says, you've already done it, uh, Mr. Jones, sorry. Get an IRS IP pin, either in, in, in a digital form where you submit your taxes online, there's a field for that, or uh, uh, on, pay, on the paper forms, there's a field for an IRS IP pin. You get a new one every year, do it. So that's the six pins. And that's why my favorite slide is that little hand picture in case you're not already chuckling at my silly sense of humor. Okay, to wrap it up, uh, the, the, my, my, uh, I have a cyber guardian security checklist with roughly 60 do's and don'ts. Uh, it's the heart of my book on Amazon. There's a picture of the cover to get that checklist. You can go to my website. It's in the chat. Let's talk about reasonable security and Stan and I had a good conversation about this and I've improved this slide based on that because I always learn from Stan. So increasing risk across the columns, users, everybody if in, in the average risk category, if you're an average person and I fall into that, uh, you'd wanna do the top 10 that I just talked about. You wanna review the rest versus the pain that might occur if you get hacked and the effort that it takes to uh, uh, fix it, to, follow through with that security checklist item. And you should probably do this every year and sometimes more frequently. For those in, in increasing risk, such as heavy users, people who work at home, for example, you wanna, I, I recommend adding that virtual private network to give you that extra measure of network security. You certainly wanna complete the very high and the high uh, beyond the top 10, of in my security checklist. And again, do the rationale versus how much, it, how much you stand to lose and how much effort, and more frequently than the, the average risk person. Do it quarterly. And finally, if you're a high net worth person or you're famous or you're a business owner, probably should invest in a YubiKey. And you wanna complete all the checklist items or at least versus the pain and the effort, uh, and more frequently again. So. All of us have a personal attack surface. It's perforated. Look at those dashes there. Yeah, it's in three parts. It's what you do. You do email, you do text, you make calls, you browse, you play games. What you use, you use a smartphone, you use a PC, you use your home network. You have data. Your data includes your name, your phone number, your address, your credit score, your passwords, all sorts of things, a lot of things that you don't want to become public. And the bad guys will send you phishing attacks, emails, spam emails. They'll smish you, my favorite word. That's getting a text that has bad links or bad things not to click on. That's called a smish. There's a vish, is a robocall. I love smish and vish. I just, I don't know, I just smile involuntarily when I say those words. You have phony web ads. Then there's spying that can go on to your network. And now where it gets delivered over your network. Finally, the things that can happen to your data is identity theft, SIM swaps that I talked about, and credit card fraud. All of those are things you want to prevent. So get educated, attend sessions like this, Read a book perhaps about details if you need more and be diligent. Prepare your devices and maintain them. Take protective action on your data. Okay, like things like freezing, freezing your credit. And what will happen? You'll build a cyber guardian wall that will get rid of the bad guys. So become a cyber guardian. It's a reality as Stan explained, and uh, for it's a reality for individuals and businesses. Make yourself hard to impersonate. Two-factor authentication, the six pins, gives you some more protection. 
Know with whom you're communicating. Listen to Benjamin Franklin. Distrust and caution are the parents of security and be prepared. Do, do your software updates, do your data backups, and the bad guys, again, go away. There's also something you can try. It's a first cut. Download it from the App Store, the Better Now app. It incorporates the security checklist in two packages called templates, Security Base and Security Plus. You can step through each, you can store yourself, and you can improve your personal cybersecurity. I'm done. Time for questions. Back to you, Stan. Wrap it up. Back to you, Deepak. Well, go with uh, Dr. Stahl. This was wonderful uh, from both of you, Dr. Stahl, Dr. Kranz. Um, I'll have uh, Dr. Stahl, uh, you know, giving any concluding remarks and answer questions if there are any. Dan. Let me unmute. There we go. Uh, yeah, so first again, Deepak, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to speak to you. And, and Steve, great, great talk. Um, what you're looking at now, we have a ton of resources on the Secure the Village website. Uh, certainly join us in any of our events. We've month, month, these are all monthly community engagement that Steve heads up that whole group, uh, workforce working group that's, and, and again, as, as students and all, cybersecurity is a great career with a ton of openings in, in the space right now. And we've got a workforce working group that meets monthly on how to, mad, how to get people into the workforce and how to help them get those first jobs, which are the, the, the challenging things, a lot of intern programs and so on. On the legal side, what's reasonable security? Uh, the intersection of IT and information security. On, and if you're technical, that's a good place. Join us on our, our happy hours. They're uh, specifically late in the afternoon. So join us with a glass of wine or, or something, uh, something stronger, uh, Texas whiskey. I don't know, what, what, whatever. Uh, I do a monthly webinar as, as well that uh, goes over various aspects of, of cybersecurity. And then use our library. We, we, we publish a weekly news of the week. It's free. Uh, we've been doing this for 12 years now. It's an aggregation of about 25 stories in the news every week, along with our weekend patch report. Steve talked about the importance of keeping your computers patched and updated. Well. How do you know when there are patches? That's, that's what our weekend patch report's designed to do. And it's for residents. It's, it's, this is not for corporations because they should have their own vulnerability management yeah. system. But we covered the things that Windows and Adobe and Firefox and those kinds of programs. A very large resource library. Um, and, and we also have a, a village square where you can identify with meat other cybersecurity prof uh, professionals, lawyers, and people like me, you know, infrastructure people and insurance people and so on. And we're actually building communities there and we'll be uh, rolling that out later this year. Uh, so you will actually have, have a, a communities of, of people working together, collaborating together. Uh, just summary of the three th key things to remember this stuff is real. Steve gave you some really, really good examples. Everybody's got to get involved. It's a management discipline uh, at the individual level, that personal management. And Steve talked a lot about pain versus effort. One of the things about effort, when you look at basic hygiene, we set our alarm every night before we turn in. You know, we got an alarm on our house. That's basic physical security. When we first got that several years ago, it took special mental effort every night. Oh, did you set the alarm? And so there was some effort involved. There's no effort anymore. It's just part of what we do. Think about, you know, do you have to stop and think to remind yourself to brush your teeth twice a day or three times, you know, whatever it is. No, it's, it's habit. It's hygiene. We've learned to do that. As you do the cybersecurity things, those things that Steve's talked about, that effort becomes less and less and less and less. So keep that in mind and get involved. Absolutely. We need all hands on deck time. And the reason we do uh, takes me to, to my, my next slide. Uh, 
favorite quote of, of, of Bobby Kennedy's that the future is not a gift, it's an achievement. And this is an achievement, this cybersecurity, getting our arms around protecting our personal information, our corporate information, our national, national information. That's an achievement. We got to do our work if we want to have security in our systems and in our lives that way. And I mean, if, if, if we don't do it, who will? You know, it's up to us. Each one of us has to protect our piece of this. So, you know, take that take that very, very seriously. You know, this, this is not just an academic exercise, but it's real. And I, I wanna finish up. We had a speaker a couple of years ago at a conference, Ron Ross. Ron is one of the unsung heroes of cybersecurity. He runs the cybersecurity program, uh, he and his colleagues at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And he gave a talk, it's on our website. You can look that up if you look up Ron Ross's name in the search bar. Uh, and his final slide, he talked about security and privacy. And basically the idea is if we don't have security, if we don't have privacy, we don't have freedom. Our freedoms go away. You can see they're under attack right now, uh, whether from Russia, uh, the Chinese, uh, the cyber criminals all over the world, or our own internal uh, dysfunctions that are being fed so often by cyber crime, cyber exploits, and, and so on. Without security and privacy, we don't have freedom. And then Ron finished his talk by saying, every morning he gets up, and I do the same thing. Actually, my wife does the same thing with our dog. But every morning Ron gets up and he takes his dog out for a walk. And when he goes out there and takes his dog for a walk, he takes a deep, deep, deep breath of free. Take a death of a breath of free. Take a deep breath. This, we live in a free country and we're totally blessed to be able to do so. I mean, my, my grandparents came here from Eastern Europe where they were not free. And all of us, uh, except for the, the Native Americans, the indigenous people uh, and the descendants of the people who were brought over in slavery, but all the rest of us are here because of our freedoms. And those freedoms are at risk right now. So recognize we are free. And if we don't protect our information, if we don't secure it and keep it private, we will lose our freedom. It's as simple as, as, as that. So I encourage you, take a deep breath of free right now and use that as a motivator to do the kinds of things that Steve and I have been talking about and that you're all gonna hear about over the course of this next month in during Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So uh, Deepak, let me turn it back over to you with, with total gratitude to you for giving Steve and myself and the opportunity to speak to all of you and to the good work that, that you're doing at the University of North Texas to help build this secure and private world that we need to get into. So thanks, Deepak. Oh, thanks, uh, Steve and, uh, and Stan. This is amazing. And I uh, hear, I heard your talk last time and I was impressed. And this time again, I'm impressed. And I would like to tell all the students here, right? Many of them are in many technical courses that getting the principles that, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Stahl started and then getting the practices that Dr. Kranz talked about is, is extremely important for us. Not just for, you know, uh, being as an individuals, but also when we work for organizations and all of us will be, we'll end up working with some organization or the other. And what we hear, uh, what we do there would be maybe detrimental to the organization and the, their customers, right? We are in business schools. We are going to be all part of businesses in the future. So this was a uh, very nice talks, uh, two talks that we had. And now we are going to hear from Michael. He comes to us uh, from Goldman Sachs. And if you did not believe what we heard so far, then Michael will tell us in detail how things go wrong. And, you know, like um, 
we have uh, uh, Steve is the cyber guardian. Uh, Michael is uh, part of our uh, money guardian, uh, right? Uh, so let me uh, share the screen. Uh, uh, Michael, are you going to uh, move the screen or I should do it? Uh, you can do it, Deepak, that'd be fine. All right, so let me make sure that I'm sharing the right information. You can see uh, Michael's uh, slides. Yep, that is it. All right, thanks, uh, Michael, take it away. All right, thank you, Deepak. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Deepak, for inviting me to uh, contribute to this presentation. Um, Dr. Stahl, Dr. Kranz, thank you so much for your, uh, for your presentation. It was really, really informative. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to do with this, with my presentation here, was kind of drill down on two specific types of threats that everyone on this call is likely to have, either have already seen or will see. Um, for those of you who are just kind of starting out your careers, I guarantee these are two things you're going to run into. Um, why? Because we see it every single day. We am talking about my organization. I've seen it kind of in my personal life. I've seen it in my professional life as well. Um, so Deepak, if you would move to the next slide, please. All right, just I'll talk very quickly about myself. Uh, I work for Goldman Sachs. What do I do for Goldman? I lead the cyber threat analysis team. So that's cyber threat intelligence. So what, so what does that mean? Uh, what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out which type of cyber actors are targeting our firm and our employees and how. Uh, what I do is I work with our other teams and our security incident response team to help mitigate risk. So a lot of kind of big words in there. But what it comes down to is I'm trying to get in the minds of the attackers to understand how they're going to attack us and try and stop them either at the front door or stop them if they, heaven forbid, try to get inside. So I've um, been with Goldman for about a little over six years now. Prior to that, I was actually based out of Washington, D.C., where I did a lot of consulting for both the government as well as uh, commercial uh, clients. So my background, interestingly enough, is not in information technology. It's actually in uh, intel analysis and uh, political science and criminal justice, actually. So um, you remember Dr. Stahl talked about how we have different nation states that are trying to steal information from us. That's for that's that geopolitical aspect. What happens in the real world can be reflected in cyberspace. So totally different conversation for maybe a different time. But um, anyways, next slide, please. All right, there we go. So I want to talk about two different things that, you're, that you've probably either already run into or will soon. And, and not because it's not through any fault of your own. But most likely, these are, these are threats you are going to see. The first one, uh, malicious applications. I'm going to focus primarily on mobile applications. Why mobile applications? Well, we all have a phone. Many, many people have tablets. And this goes for both iPhones as well as Android-based phones. Although Android-based phones are a little bit easier to get malware on those phones, uh, simply because of the way that the Android operating system is, is architected, being that it's an open operating system. But malicious mobile applications. So I focus primarily on, in my day-to-day business life on, on banking applications. So these are your anything from the app for your, for your bank to apps that claim to provide connectivity to multiple accounts. Um, and these are ones that you'll find oftentimes, unfortunately, they sneak into different app stores. So you think about the Android Play Store, you think about the Apple App Store, they'll sneak in there. Um, what are they trying to do? Um, they're both trying, they're basically trying to steal information. So legitimate applications, if you, I'm talking about the ones like from social, uh, different social networks, they're actually following you around, whether I'm sure there's, you've probably seen a lot of headlines about that. Um, they're trying to gather information on you to sell as part of a, um, advertising campaign, sell to potential people who are interested in, in marketing things to you. That is legal. That's okay. They're collecting information on you. Well, whether you think it's okay or not, it's a matter of personal opinion, but that's what they're doing. Malicious applications, they're actually stealing information to try and steal from you. And that could be anything from actual intellectual property or private information to, um, to your bank account information, actually steal money. So you might think, well, I don't really, you know, well, why, would, why would someone want to steal money from me? I, there's companies, there's other individuals that have lots of other, have more money in their bank accounts than me. Yeah, well, these, these threat actors don't care because to them, it's, it's about volume. They can get into, if they can get into your bank account and steal several hundred dollars or more, they're happy about it because they can do it rather easily. So these malicious mobile applications, they, they, they do masquerade as legitimate apps. Um, they will use the exact same logos, they'll use the exact same wording that you'll find um, when uh, you go to an app store and see the description for a particular application. They'll use the exact same wording. Now, it used to be, and I say used to be maybe five, 10 years ago, a lot of these fake applications were pretty obvious to spot. Uh, they were often either the, the logos were, um, uh, they had the wrong aspect ratio, so they looked either kind of stretched 
um, or the uh, the descriptions, or when you open the application, you can see that uh, it was written by someone who's very clearly not a native English speaker. Um, and they just, the words were, and things were phrased in a way that um, not likely to come from a business. A business wouldn't phrase a sentence in this particular fashion. Nowadays, um, the threat actors, at the very least, what they'll do is they'll actually copy and paste direct um, advertising information from the particular uh, bank or institution they're trying to mimic, um, or they're actually just writing really good descriptions. Um, now, not all of them are that way, but the most sophisticated ones are that way. So the point being is that you should really want to, to scrutinize what apps you're actually downloading onto your phone or onto your tablet. Um, I mentioned your BYOD, bring your own device. So um, when I first started working, uh, what they did is if they wanted you to be able to access uh, email, uh, they would give you a company owned BlackBerry. If you know what a BlackBerry is, points to you. I don't think they exist anymore. Um, but they would give you as a company BlackBerry. What that meant was it had a direct connection to the company's email account. That's the only thing you could do to access uh, your email. Nowadays, what businesses have realized, it's actually a lot more cost effective if you just use your own device. And they give you access to your email, to maybe even the company network view your device. Now, how a company does that totally depends on what the company does for security. So you see the uh, recommendations from Dr. Stahl and Dr. Kranz. I really hope that a lot of companies are doing the same thing. However, not every company does. But the, where this comes, where this uh, could affect you is if you inadvertently download a mobile, a malicious mobile application, it can read anything on your device. It has the ability to read just about anything on your device. It can do fun things like turn on the microphone, listen to your conversations. Uh, it can read your email. Um, and so any conversation you think are private there, it can read all of that. It can intercept messages, uh, text messages. And you won't even know that you're missing text messages. It can intercept it and keep it from notifying. So we mentioned before, two-factor authentication. That is fantastic. I highly recommend what Dr. Kranz recommend, which is actually an app, a, a um, authenticator app on your phone. Because if you get some um, malware on your phone and your two-factor authentication sends you an email or sends you a text, guess what? That can be intercepted by this malware. You have an app, you have an actual application on your phone generating uh, those codes, definitely safer. Now, is it the safest? I don't know if anything is super, super, is 100% safe but definitely better than anything being sent in transmissions. And any of that stuff can be absolutely be uh, intercepted. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so prominent types of mobile malware. I kind of, I kind of talked about this a little before, um, and this has definitely been mentioned by Dr. Stahl and Dr. Krantz. Um, th these are kind of four general categories. There's probably a couple other different categories out there, but according to CrowdStrike, these are your basic four categories. The one is remote access Trojans, first one. Um, these ones are designed to operate in the background and collect data. So this is kind of your basic functionality of any type of mobile malware, any malware in general. So uh, you heard from about key loggers. Absolutely. I mean, at the heart of it, that's what they're doing. They're trying to capture whatever keystrokes you're putting into your phone, into your computer or whatever. I mentioned banking Trojans before. Those are ones that are very specific. What they're trying to do is not necessarily mimic any type of application, but banking applications specifically. And that goal there is to absolutely commit fraud. They want to gain access to your accounts and they want to steal money from you. Um, third one, crypto mining and malware. So this one's kind of interesting. Um, so you've, I'm sure you've heard of Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies, a lot of them out there. Um, Ethereum, if you're a fan of Elon Musk, there's Dogecoin, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I don't know. I don't mess with cryptocurrency, that's just a personal preference. But how do you generate cryptocurrency? Well, you have to mine it, what does that mean? You have to use a lot of computing power to actually generate this cryptocurrency. Now, for businesses, what they're worried about actually, what they do, a lot of them when it comes to cryptocurrency is actually a, a cryptocurrency malware that's infecting a server. Server has a lot of computing resources. It can help generate that cryptocurrency a lot quicker. But what Thrashers are also doing is setting up malware that does cryptocurrency mining on individual devices. That may not sound like a lot because you think, well, my phone is not nearly as powerful as a server. Yes, but do that, do that personal device times 100,000 or even not even that, 50,000. Now you've got a decent amount of computing power when you, plot, when you link them all together in a botnet. So um, one way to check to see if that's happening, is your phone really hot all the time? Um, is it seem to lose battery quite a bit? Does it seem very slow? These are all, these are all um, clues that there could be a, an application in the background that's using up a lot of your phone resources. Is it always gonna be a cryptocurrency miner? Of course not. There's some applications that are buggy and do that. Uh, my phone definitely did that last time I tried to update uh, to iOS. So now I wait, <laughs> I learned the hard way, I had to reinstall everything. Was that cryptocurrency? No, but that's an example where maybe you got to kind of think about that. Last one, advertising click fraud. So this one's kind of interesting. It is definitely malicious, but not in the way that's trying to steal anything from you. It's more trying to 
basically exploit your exploit the platform. So if you're familiar with how mobile advertising works or basically advertising over the web, um, some advertisers get money by how many clicks they get on their banners or on their links. Well, there's malware out there that actually simulate clicks or actually go to different websites and click and click without you knowing about it. And so therefore they generate, they generate revenue that way. So that's, these are kind of the, the four overall categories. And I mentioned this before, but one thing I want to mention is both remote access Trojans and banking Trojans are designed to steal credentials and websites. How do they do that? One is they do the key logging, but two, the bank, some of these uh, banking Trojans are really, really uh, clever. They'll only wake up, meaning start listening to the, to the uh, logging credentials that you use when you visit a particular banking website. So they'll have come with a, a configuration list of a bunch of different banks. And these are not only US based, they could be definitely be based outside of the US. Once it once it figures out that you have visited that banking website on your um, on your phone or use that app, guess what? And start listening, grab those credentials, and then send them off to the command and control server where the threat actor can then gather them and then log into your account later uh, when you're not when you don't realize it. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So, how do we avoid these? Um, some of this is common sense. Um, Dr. Stahl, Dr. Kranz kind of mentioned this already. Um, what you want to do is, as I mentioned before, uh, the threat actors have gotten a lot better at kind of making these apps look very, very much like the official application. So just because it, an app you downloads looks okay, that's not, that's not good enough. What you want to make sure is that uh, if you download a legitimate app, uh, that you want to know exactly how that app actually operates. And if it, something like that changes, or if you download another, you think you download the same app later, is there something different about it? Okay, that could be, that could be an indicator. Maybe you downloaded a malicious application. Um, or a, an application trying to mimic your bank one that's actually has, uh, that is malicious. So that's, be, that's one thing you want to look out for. Um, second one, this one seems also rather obvious, but you'd be surprised. Download applications from the official developers or company's website. Do not download it from any other random place on the web. If you have rooted your device, um, this is definitely something that some iPhone users will do. That means you can download any application from anywhere on the web other than the Apple App Store. Seems like a great idea. Security-wise, awful idea, because you don't know if these websites are actually the official websites for your bank or for uh, the uh, actual company you're looking at. Um, Android, you can download an app from any website you want. So you've got to be very, very careful. Now, if you trust that website, okay, but go to the official website. Don't click on a link, go to Google, Google the name of that company or that bank, click on their website. They'll have a link either to the app store that goes to the, the actual official app or they'll have, a, they'll have the app directly on their site. That's where you want to go download it. You don't want to download any apps from any other sources because you're just introducing a level of risk to you that you probably don't want. Uh, I mentioned this already before, being aware of the responsiveness, responsiveness of your device. If your device all of a sudden seems slow, does not, operating, does not operate well, battery runs out, you get all these kind of notifications and warnings, okay, there could be something going on there. Is it always malware? Not necessarily. But I would definitely, for me, a lot of kind of alarm bells start going off. Dr. Krantz mentioned this, mentioned this last one, credit monitoring can absolutely be helpful. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say you absolutely need to get credit monitoring or that there's a certain co company you should go with. Me personally, I've been involved in about five different breaches going back to the Office of Personnel Management uh, in 2015 because I, um, I was working for the government at the time. And guess what? Uh, they've got all my information. So great. Um, but the part of that, they gave me free credit monitoring, I think, for probably the rest of my life. Um, but I've got overlapping credit monitoring because I was part of the Target breach, the Home Depot breach, you name it. Uh, unfortunately, I've been involved in a lot of these breaches, mostly because they had my credit card number. Um, so you definitely want to have some sort of credit monitoring, or at least monitor your credit at the, at the four different bureaus, because you want to see if you see some uh, an entry that shouldn't be there, you've got to notify them immediately. Um, and it'll very least freeze your credit report, because then the threat, the threat actors can't do a whole lot with it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this one is actually was touched, on, was touched on earlier, but wanted to kind of drill down to some more specific examples as well and provide some more of this, is business email compromise, or otherwise known as BEC. Okay, that's kind of a big phrase, what does that mean? Really, what the, at, the, at the end of the day, what it means is it's either someone who's trying to impersonate someone else at your company, or this is really the, the worst type of BEC, is where it's an actual account compromise, meaning it's a legitimate email account that a fraudster or a malicious threat actor has actually gained access to and is mimicking the person of the, the, the owner of the account. So where does that come into play? Um, so first, let me start over. So fake, fake invoices, this is a big one. Uh, and I have an example before. Um, and uh, I think Dr. Kranz mentioned this one. Uh, you get an email from your, what you believe is your CEO saying, hey, um, I got this invoice you gotta pay. Will you please wire this money over here? 
Okay, so um, one, you have to really think, okay, would, would, would my CEO actually ask me this? Um, and secondly, uh, usually what they do is there's some sort of, they try and make it like a rush, like, hey, I'm late on this. When you do this now, the client's waiting or something like that. They're always trying to get you to rush and not think and just go ahead and just do. So fake invoices are very common. It doesn't have to be, it could be anything from a DHL invoice to an Amazon. It could be anything. Um, it could be a bill you know, for any sort of a utility or something like that. I just mentioned before, CEO impersonation, very common. CFO impersonation, very, very common. Those you don't, what you're starting to see more now is this other, like I mentioned before, account compromise. So what happens is a threat actor will actually gain access to a legitimate business account. And they will sit and see that, read the conversations between you and your customer or your vendor or whomever. And then they, all of a sudden they'll insert themselves with an email from your customer or your vendor. And, and, it's, and they'll just, you won't even skip a beat. You think you're talking to the person that you actually that, that you were, thought you were talking to it, but instead you're actually talking to the threat actor. You have no idea. Um, and Dr. Kranz mentioned this. If you if you get an email thinking, wait a minute, this doesn't sound like something that this person would say. Pick up the phone and call them. Don't email them back saying, "Is this you?" Of course, the threat actor's going to say, "Yes, it's me." Um, you know, mimicking or mimicking the other person. Pick up the phone and call them uh, because that's just the best way to verify. Uh, we see this a lot business, uh, from a business standpoint, uh, with our customers and clients, Goldman Sachs is an, is an investment banking firm. We invest money on behalf of our customers and clients. Um, unfortunately, some of our customers have been compromised. And what happens is our, our analysts will get an email from what they think is a customer saying, Hey, so yeah, please move some money from this account to this account. Or actually I have a new account. Will you please just send it to this account? That's part of something I'll talk to in a minute, which is called know your customer. If that account is not something that they mentioned before, and all of a sudden they're asking you to transfer money there, that's a little bit odd, isn't it? And that's where you want to pick up the phone and, and call somebody. Um, a lot of these business email compromises, um, uh, this is kind of lumped into the same thing uh, or the same type of threat is we get typo squatted domains. What's typo squatted mean? Uh, this is where basically someone is trying to mimic the company's domain that they're trying to basically uh, defraud. So um, the example I gave there, if you look very carefully and see that it's definitely bold and underlined, sometimes, sometimes you can tell, sometimes you can't, but this is the whole point. Is if you look very quickly at the link or the URL, it looks like the official one. This is a real example. This is actually used in a nation state campaign. Uh, the threat actors registered. Uh, so if you look at the first one, google.com. The second one is not google.com. That's G-O-O-Q-L-E.com. You look very quickly, it looks like Google, right? Um, that was pretty darn clever. And unfortunately, it worked. And that this is a campaign from, gosh, got to be about 10 years ago, maybe. But this is a perfect example. We see a lot of things like Goldman Sachs with an M for the, for the N. Under, instead of gold, it looks like Goldman Sachs. Or you see um, Goldman Sachs without the S. Or um, you see Goldman, but instead of the L, it's an I. You look very quickly, it looks like an L, but it's not. It's an I. So these are things that, these are example of type of squad domains that threat set up. Now, as a business, we have ways to monitor for these and we request takedowns pretty quickly. Not all businesses have this type of capability or have the resources to do that. So it's up to you to make sure that you recognize these things. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I promised some examples. So here's some examples. Um, whether or not you can see this, uh, I'll try and speak through it a little bit. But on the left, a uh, perfect example of a, uh, a CEO impersonation. Um, this is someone who, it, so if you notice though, I, what we didn't blur out was this Gmail account. If you see the third line down on that, you know, on that image on the left, you see it's a bunch of letters and numbers at gmail.com. Okay, so you gotta take a look. You see the name and think, oh, this is definitely CEO. No, it's not. Take a look at the email. Definitely is what they're trying to, not even, they're not even trying that hard to just set up an email account, but put in the name of the CEO. And then what they're counting on is that you're not really looking very carefully and see the name. They ask you to do something and you just do it, right? Um, and there, as I mentioned before, the last sentence there, I, I will appreciate swift response. Okay, they're asking you to do this quickly, right? They don't want you to think, they want you to act. Okay, this is a, probably one of your most basic type of attempted BEC or attempted basically kind of spoofing of an individual. Now, the image on the right, the reason I want to show you that one is if you're familiar with Office 365, you'll look at that and say, well, okay, that looks like the Office 365 login. Absolutely, it is. It looks very close to it. In some cases, it actually could be it exactly. But if you look carefully at the URL and the search bar there, that's not office.com. That's not any particular business that we know of. It's facilitiesindia.ga. Okay, why would, why would that particular URL be showing me an office.com login? That doesn't make any sense. A lot of these, um, these uh, BCs, what they're trying to do is actually gather your credentials. They want, you, they want to get something from you. So they provide a link to a website that they're trying to mimic and, and trick you into giving up your, your credentials. 
Now, will multi-factor authentication save you from some of this? Absolutely. Where there is the opportunity to turn on multi-factor, absolutely turn it on. Some multi-factor is better than none. This multi-factor, of course, always foolproof, not always, but it definitely adds an extra layer of security. Cyber criminals in, in, in particular, they're gonna take the path of least resistance, meaning they will do the minimal, they will put in the minimal amount of effort to get the maximum amount of, of return. So if they try and get into your account, they see it as multi-factor authentication, they just say, forget it, move on. We'll go find someone who doesn't have multi-factor, we can directly get directly into their accounts. So does that mean that if you have multi-factor, you won't get compromised? No, of course not. But the chances of you getting compromised are a lot less. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so reducing and mitigating BC. All right, how do we do that? So um, I mentioned this before, a lot of security controls are helpful here. So, um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the individual. Uh, I like to say, I saw that the, the picture of the cartoon before in this corner, you have you know, all these controls and the other picture you have Dave. Um, I like to think of Dave as a job creator um, and uh, because if it wasn't for him clicking, I wouldn't have my job, right? Um, and we talk about it, you know, it's kind of funny, but really at the end of the day, it, it comes down to you at, 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 your, at your machine. And you have to kind of use, step back and try not to rush through everything and say, wait a minute, is this really an email I would receive? Is this really how uh, this email would be phrased? Um, because what you want to do is they're, they're counting on the fact, that's, that's social engineering. They're counting on the fact that you're just going to do what you're asked or that you want to help somebody. Um, you hear about all these different emails about, oh, if you can just help me out, uh, you know, I'll give you, some, uh, I'm a prince from this country. I'll help you out. Just give me your bank account number. No, but, but the, the reason why you still see them is because it still works. People want to help others. And so they're absolutely capitalizing and exploiting that. So that's, that's social engineering. So you want to stop and take a look and take a second and say, okay, is this really legitimate? Is this really something I would see? Is this really something that would be asked of me? Um, I mentioned before, know your customer KYC. It's definitely an industry term. Uh, the more you know your customer, especially if you're in a business where you're supporting clients, you need to know your customer because if you know that your customer behaves a certain way or then all of a sudden there's something out of the ordinary, that could be a red flag and you, it never hurts to check. If a customer is angry at you for checking, okay, you may need a new customer. <laughs> Easier said than done, but they should be grateful if you're looking out for their security. Um, and then the last one for BEC, for business email compromise, be aware of the common techniques, which I mentioned to you before. Um, if you work for a large corporation, they probably will have uh, social engineering training and phishing training. That's absolutely great. And what they want to do is make sure they have you thinking, right? Um, me being on the other side of it, I'm more than happy for, for the employees of our company to point out an email to me saying, is this legitimate or not? I'm not sure. I'm very happy to tell them, no, this email is totally legitimate. Thank you for bringing it to us. I will never get angry at anybody. <laughs> no, your security team definitely shouldn't get angry at you for bringing, uh, bringing up a potential concern that is, ends up not being a concern, especially if it's an email or a link or something like that. That is what I do, that's what the people I work with do. We, our, our job is to check and make sure that's what you're doing and that you feel safe when you're navigating the internet, working, going through your computer and uh, going through your email. I'm, I'm very happy to tell someone, no, this is perfectly fine. This is just a spam email or because more often than not, yes, this is malicious email. Please don't click on the links. Go ahead and delete it from your, from your, um, from your inbox. So I believe, I think that's all I had for today. And I know we're pretty close to the end here. So um, if there are any questions, happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, Deepak, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. And um, well, one question, so that all the lessons we have learned so far today is that bad things are happening. When did the last bad thing happen to your, that you caught in your organization? The last bad thing, uh, let's see, what time is it? Uh, probably at 1.32 p.m. Central Time. Um, I, I, say that, I say that kind of in just really uh, large uh, cor corporations, businesses of any kind, doesn't matter what, how big or small they are, they're getting attacked all the time. Um, in terms of phishing emails with all these kind of uh, uh, malicious links, we see them, uh, and it's probably on the hundreds of thousands a day. Um, it happens all the time. So. Does this mean you need to be kind of anxious and hypervigilant? I don't know if you need to be anxious, but you need to be aware. Um, because I guarantee you might think, okay, I'm just starting off this company. I'm kind of the lowest person on totem pole, uh, so to speak. Um, why would anyone try and do anything to me? Well, that's exactly who they're, who they're going to attack. They're going to try and attack anyone and everyone. They just need to get people to click. They need to get people to visit that one site. And so they will try and find anybody. So for us to answer your question, Deepak, we are attacked all the time. Um, is it all serious stuff? Not necessarily. We have a lot of controls to identify potential malicious or suspicious activities so we actually catch it before it's be a problem. But every now and then, yeah, there's there's something that pops up that we need to actually get, get 
everyone on deck to help us actually investigate and, and mitigate the risk. And, and right, and that's what I wanted to ask that, you know, what, what we have heard today is not something that does not exist. It happens all the time. It's just that if we start following what we have heard from our experts today, then it, uh, we will become safer. And it is just like, uh, you know, the more individuals are safer, the less business there is for the uh, those cyber criminals who decided to go into the cyber crime for health reasons. <laughs> so, um, so well, I think uh, we are a little bit beyond time. I just want to, uh, you know, first of all, thank um, uh, Dr. Stahl, Dr. Krantz, um, uh, Mr. Brazendine, and uh, for wonderful talks that we had. I would also like to uh, do a little plug for the rest of the uh, month's activity and also for one of the uh, programs that you know I have put in place. Um, so uh, we heard about principles and practices of uh, staying safe in cyberspace. We heard about that these things are really happening, right? It is not just uh, an, an academic subject or somebody's thinking. Uh, so uh, how to become a cyber messenger. So cyber guardian is all of us, but like uh, <clears throat> we heard, you know, being aware and engaged uh, from uh, Dr. Stahl's uh, discussion, and we heard some uh, specific uh, practices that we can all follow. So if you want to become aware and engaged uh, and, you know, share with other people, I have an opportunity for all the students here at uh, UNT join me, uh, write an email to me. I'm going to send an email to the students uh, that, so the Cyber Messenger program is that you will learn a five specific uh, practices from us that you will learn from me and in the group, and you will teach to five other people in your sphere of influence. And uh, we will uh, discuss it over a period of uh, one month. And uh, if you finish that, you will get a certificate from me, which would be really important uh, from me when I say, I mean, from the ITDS department, which would be a nice one liner on your resume. And you can uh, you know, talk about uh, what you know about cybersecurity. And I can almost bet, and pro probably Michael can verify that if they hear anyone who has thought about cybersecurity, it would be a, a considered good for them uh, in their hiring process. So with that, I think I'm going to close uh, the session. Um, and we have a lineup of uh, on October 15th, 22nd, and 29th. We are, uh, so this information will, uh, you know, circulate among UNT students. Uh, and you're all welcome to join. You can register there and I'll send you the information. The rec session today has been recorded and will become available for later on. So again, thanks uh, everybody for joining and thanks um, uh, Stan, Steve, Michael for a wonderful uh, discussion. Thank you, Deepak. Thanks. Thanks, Deepak. Thanks, Stan. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you, thanks to you. Thanks everybody. And I'm going to hang around for a little bit if anybody- Thank you, Professor. Thanks.